This slide is showing the um, um, structure and the significance of cardiac muscle cells. Cardiac muscle cells, first of all, are short, branched, they're fat and kind of interconnected. But what's important to remember about them too is that they are branched. They're going to um, resemble, be very similar to skeletal muscle. However, there are some significant differences. They have many more mitochondria present in the cell and that's because the heart needs a plethora of oxygen, needs a whole bunch of it. And the rest of the volume is composed of sarcomeres, the functional unit of these muscles. And the sarcomere would have all the same parts present. The Z band, the A band, the I band are all going to be present. And the... Um, most significant part of cardiac muscle is what's called the intercalated discs. And the intercalated discs are made up of two major structures called the desmosome and the gap junction. Desmosome is going to allow the cells not to rip apart when there's extreme contraction of the heart. And the gap junction allows ions to pass quickly from cell to cell, predominantly calcium. And the reason for all this it's because we want an entire region of the heart to work as one coordinated unit. And that coordinated unit is called a functional syncytium. So the word syncytium means one unit. Think how awful it would be if only a region of your right atrium contracted. You want your entire right atrium to contract as one unit. So the microscopic anatomy of the cardiac muscle looks like this. So under a microscope, it's going to look a lot different than skeletal muscle. The predominant different is, difference is the intercalated disc. Also, you can see there's some space between the cells. You wouldn't see this in skeletal muscle. So the intercalated disc has gap junctions within it. That's what allows for the ions to go quickly from cell to cell. It also has desmosomes, which prevent the myocytes from pulling apart. So how does the physiology of skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle differ? Well, the similarities between the two are that the muscle contraction is preceded by a depolarizing action potential. So that part still is the same. The wave travels down the T tubules, causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. So it's important to remember that the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores the calcium. And calcium binds to troponin, just like in skeletal muscle. But the way that they are different is that cardiac muscles are self-excitable. In fact, if you take a cardiac muscle and you put it in a petri dish, drop some sodium on it, or calcium, it will contract on its own. So skeletal muscle definitely cannot do that. The two kinds of myocytes in the muscle are contractile cells. And these contractile cells are the large majority of the cells. And then there's the pacemaker cells, which are the intrinsic conduction system of the heart. So the heart also is, contracts as a unit, so that's also different. There's an influx of calcium, but first it comes from the extracellular fluid, not just the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And a way that that applies to patients is a lot of times when they're suffering from heart failure, one of the medicines that's first given is something that increases the amount of extracellular fluid calcium. Another thing that happens is Titanic contractions cannot occur. You um, remember that uh, from skeletal muscle, tetany occurs because various skeletal muscles contract, the action potentials add up and combine to produce a smooth muscle contraction. This doesn't happen here because there's a longer absolute refractory period which prohibits another cardiac muscle contraction. The other thing is that the heart relies on aerobic respiration 
and this is evident because of the large amount of mitochondria that's present in cardiac muscle versus skeletal muscle. So it absolutely cannot function without oxygen. This table is summarizing the key differences between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. So skeletal muscle is long, silical, cylindrical, multinucleate, whereas cardiac muscle is striated. It's um, short, branched, has one or two nuclei per cell. There's no gap junctions in skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle does have gap junctions. The uh, T-tubules are abundant in skeletal muscle, but there's less in cardiac muscle because they're not needed. Calcium comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum only in skeletal muscle, but it comes also from the extracellular fluid in cardiac muscle. So let's look at the pacemaker cells here that are present. The pacemaker cells are going to be cells that can depolarize kind of on their own. And they are part of the intrinsic conduction system. So the intrinsic conduction system is non-contractile autorhythmic cells. And those cells make up about 1% of all the cells of the heart. The action potential would be initiated by these pacemaker cells. These would be parts of the, um, the heart, kind of like the SA node, the AV node, and so on. And what's significant about this is that the, they depolarize much more easily. And we can see this on this slide. First, we see that the pacemaker potential um, occurs. There's a slow depolarization due to the opening of the sodium channels, closing of potassium channels, and notice that the resting membrane potential is a little higher, so it's much easier to reach threshold. It's at about negative 60 instead of negative 70 to negative 90. So the depolarization begins when the pacemaker potential reaches threshold, Depolarization is due to an influx of calcium. And then the repolarization is that the potassium is leaving the cell. So it's kind of like calcium in, or sodium, calcium in, potassium out. So these pacemaker cells are present in these five different areas. And the normal sequence of excitation should be that the SA node, the sinoatrial node, should fire first. When it's malfunctioning, there is an artificial pacemaker usually that's needed in that case. And that spreads action potentials throughout to both atria. You can see arrows going down the right atrium as well as to the left atria. The impulses then pause at the AV node and they pause to allow the entire mass of the atria to be depolarized first before the signal continues. Then it reaches the AV bundle and um, also called the bundle of Hiss. Then the bundle branches extend down the interventricular septum here and continue to the outer parts of the myocardium called the subendocardial network, or more commonly referred to just as Purkinje cells. So once the signal reaches out to this area, then the ventricle can contract. And that happens with the pacemaker of the heart in the right atrial wall. The normal impulses should be about 75 beats per minute, and this is what's referred to as the sinus rhythm. The AV node then has a much lower um, beat, so if somebody has problems with their SA node, the AV node is what's going to take over. However, the heart rate is much, much lower, and it decreases as we continue down the intrinsic system. So we have the AV bundle, bundle of Hiss, the uh, 
pathways in the interventricular septum are the right and left bundle branches, and they carry impulses to the apex of the heart. From the apex of the heart, then the electrical potential continues out through the Purkinje fibers.